and stories. And I thought, oh, that would really be fun. Uh, some of you know that I like to tell stories, and, and uh, the problem was selecting just a few to talk with you about tonight. Uh, and I called it transformative realizations. I made that up. It sounded kind of cool, like, like you go, oh, it's a big transformation this guy's gone through over the years, and realizations like aha moments. And you'll see a little bit of that. I hope you, 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 you see that. But I did organize it into some stories that I'd like to tell tonight and review at the end just a little bit. But I did want to talk about the Leopold Institute. You know, wilderness research, the Wilderness Act passed in 64. Wilderness research really came as a Forest Service Research Unit here to campus, University of Montana, in 1967. Uh, by 1968, or 1978, just 11 years after that, I was a graduate student at Virginia Tech funded by this research unit. And they funded my master's and doctoral work. And eventually I came out here in 1988 and I've been here for that 27 years. Actually, I chose today as my, uh, Natalie let me uh, as a local 
choose which day I would do this, and I did it today because yesterday was my 27th anniversary on campus. And it's an easy uh, day to remember because I came from a, a university in Georgia, became a federal employee, and my first day was a federal holiday. And it's like, what a great place to work. You know, I, I was knocking on the door trying to get in. I had my U-Haul truck and I was trying to unload stuff. And like, where is everybody, you know? And there was no one over there. We used to be in the building. It shows in the background of that, which doesn't look like that anymore. I need to get a new photo. If you ever go to that part of campus, there's a second floor on that other, the old Forest Sciences Lab. And that's where we were for, for many, many years. And uh, the Leopold Institute became an interagency institute in 1993. So uh, since that time, we've been interior and agriculture. And we certainly did work at all across the National Wilderness Preservation System before. But a little bit more acknowledgement, funding, uh, more advice, for, for sure, from the interior agencies that work with us. And uh, we are very much an interagency. So tonight, you know, it's a great opportunity for me. Uh, I, I, I feel a lot of smiles here that, uh, that I'm not being asked to talk about science so much as the stories about science. And that's really fun because 95% of the time I'm defending you know, a statistical test or, or trying to debate one theoretical foundation over another or, or I'm arguing with uh, somebody over uh, uh, some particular implication and conclusion. And I'm not going to do that tonight. You, you know, there's no right and wrong. I'm just telling you some stories tonight. But I do have to acknowledge, and I'm a little bit embarrassed about this, but uh, along the way, all along all those years and all the research I've done, uh, there's a lot of people that uh, some of the stories I tell tonight, a couple of people in the room will go, yeah, I told him that story, or I was there when he learned that. And I'm particularly conscious about Adam Liljeblad being here because I'm, I, I gave an acknowledgement of about 22 people who's a big part of who I am. And it so happened that my wife called today and said she's coming to the lecture, and I took Adam's name out and I put hers in, because I only had room for 22 names. <laughs> Sorry, Adam. Uh, but Bill made it and a few other people. But, you know, there's a lot of people. There's students, there's faculty, uh, other universities, there's managers, there's a lot of people. And, and I only had room kind of to get 22 in, or it would have got up where you couldn't read it. But I did want to kind of acknowledge that the years I've been here, you know, 27 years on campus and before that working uh, in academia, uh, all the people I've worked with that, that have really gotten excited and I've chosen the people who are really excited with me about w doing wilderness research and kind of how we learn along the way and how it's affected our research. And you know, I also thought that I could put up another list that would be an interesting one, I haven't developed it, of people who've influenced me because I tried not to be like them if you understand that. My, my father was one of those people. <laughs> yeah. My father had a fifth grade education. He didn't care about nature. He didn't want to travel. He sat in front of the TV, you know. And I think I spent my whole life trying to not to be like him. Well, I think there's scientists like that as well. And there's even students and employees and, and people that, you know, I have to stop once in a while like I did with my father and say, Boy, he had an effect on me, and a lot of who I am today is as a result of, 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 of him, and I think there's a group of people. So if you're in the room, particularly, I want to make sure Adam knew that, that, uh, that if you're not on this list, that doesn't mean you're on the other list. I just ran out of room, okay? <laughs> but uh, I want to talk about stories, and, and my first story is kind of who I am. And, and you know, as I developed this story, I thought about my mother, who passed away several years ago, who never understood what I did. You know, my wife is here tonight and she does know what I do because she travels with me a lot. We engage, we write articles together and, and she's a scientist. And But uh, you know, my children don't really know what I do. Uh, my grown children, uh, my mother never knew. And I uh, always kind of regret that. I never could quite set her down and you know, she, I gave her a copy of my thesis. She goes, oh, he wrote a book, you know? And she's so excited, you know? It, she never read it or looked at it. It could have been blank. Um, but she knew, you know, I travel to Russia, I go to Arctic Refuge, South Africa, I go to the Boundary Waters, uh, someplace called Nunavut in the, in, in the eastern Arctic of Canada, uh, go down the main fork, middle fork of the salmon, go to the Boundary Waters. I mean, she hears me talk about these places. She knows I go to other countries and I'm, I'm always traveling, I'm always doing stuff, but she never really knew what I did. And I tried to articulate for you uh, what, a, what a wilderness scientist does, at least how I perceive it. And, and one thing is, is defining questions, okay? 
And I wish I could have set her down here and say, Mom, what I do is, and she wouldn't even understood it, but I think you will. You know, I'm really fortunate to be in front of a, an educated, uh, interested group of people that part of my job is defining questions. You know, we had managers from Alaska years ago say, you need to come to Alaska. You haven't done any research here. Okay, well, what's the questions? Well, you need to come up here. Or, or in the Sierras, they say, oh, we got some issues with horses. Well, what are they? Well, you need to come see us. And I kind of like that. I guess that's how I've got to travel and got license to travel around the world. But we often have, a scientist has to figure out, well, what exactly is the question? Have we already answered it? Or is it a new question? Choosing methodologies, Bill Borey knows that I'm a methodologist. I'm probably most proud of the work as a methodologist. And Bill, faculty in Society of Conservation, we talk a lot about methodology and what we've, what we've contributed over the years and how we got. And, and I hope the stories tonight take you on that path so you'll understand where we went and how we got to where we are in some of the methodologies we use in wilderness science. And collecting data, no, it's not always me collecting data, it might be Elena, it might be Adam, it might be Bill and others and, and students or when he was a student, but we certainly collect data, we analyze the data, uh, many people in Missoula, I was kind of hoping Neil Christensen might show up tonight because we spend a lot of time, in, or Katie Notek, uh, that's worked for the Forest Service now, thought she might be in, and think of all the times we've spent together, you know, looking at analysis and writing reports and articles, and that's what we, that's what we do, and, and we enjoy that. Sharing through publications and making presentations like this one, and facilitating, so the World Wilderness Congress, the International Journal of Wilderness, uh, kind of helping other people exchange information, present science to other people. That's my job, that's what I've done. Well, in those 37 years, the topics have really changed. Most of you know, if you didn't, if you didn't already, I said 1964 is the Wilderness Act, so 2014 was the 50th anniversary. And we've done a lot of summarizing and reviewing and kind of where have we been over the last few years. Chris Armitas, University of Montana, over has been working with us to archive data sets. And we work at Salish Kootenai College also, archiving data sets we're about to put a whole bunch of data sets, including yours, Adam, and some that Bill's helped us with and others, are about to go online for posterity purposes, you know, so that people will looking for data sets or exploring questions in the future will have access to, you know, 50 or 60 data sets that we've developed over those 37 years. And it's been really a time of looking back over 50 years of science and wilderness. And what I tried to do, again, if, if my mom was here, I'd try to explain to her, I said, well, well you know, when I first started graduate school, wilderness social science was, was recreation, is what it was. It was very focused on recreation. By the time I came here in 1988, we were heavily focused on social science indicators and standards. We were talking a little bit beyond recreation, but mostly recreation. So if you've worked around wilderness planning or management or research, you've heard the, terms L, the term LAC, Limits of Acceptable Change. It was a planning framework that kind of came out of the University of Montana and Forest Service Research, working with the Flathead National Forest to set up a, 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 a kind of a framework for planning for wilderness. It was heavily focused on protecting wilderness attributes from some identified threats, mostly from the, the threat associated with recreation use and users, and didn't go much beyond that at that point in time. So my first few years here, we were, I was trying to catch up with uh, LAC. We were doing training, we were doing research, um, really trying to replicate some studies at new places to understand how we manage for humans and their experiences inside the boundary of wilderness, very focused. And it was probably, oh, and very many years before we kind of stopped that, and said, okay, other people can do that now. We've, we've set up some methods, we've done a lot of studies, other people can do that. And what we'll do is, is, is think where we go next, and there's been a whole series of kind of transitions and some of the articles we've written this last year, they're available on our website and one in, in press right now, is kind of thinking about how society has changed in their relationship with the wilderness, how policies have changed, why has science changed, why, you know, my mom would say, why did you keep changing, you know, why didn't you just stick with one thing and do a good job at it? And instead of that, we've gone through kind of down this list over time and the first one was understanding wilderness experiences. Rather than be driven by the Wilderness Act that talked about solitude, 
and we're trying to figure out solitude. We didn't know how to measure it. So we thought, well, crowding must have something to do with it, but we don't know how to measure that. So encountering people must be a surrogate for that, and let's, let's measure that and try to understand how it impacts people's experiences. We did that a lot. And we stopped and turned around and said, let's go out more blank and ask about wilderness experiences. And what's, what are those threats that we haven't identified? And what are contributing factors? And there's a whole line of research we did for several years that was very eye-opening that was after a lot of the recreation research, trying to think about wilderness experiences more broadly. I worked with a guy named Dan Williams that was on my list. And we published a paper called Beyond the Commodity Metaphor. Some people were really offended by that because we we're, were saying recreation research had been very commodity oriented. It's almost like it's a product we're producing and we're marketing it and people are trying to define it real precisely. And there's something about wilderness we felt like was, you know, we haven't quite figured it out yet. So in the, in the late 18, uh, 1980s sorry, and the early 1990s, we were still trying to figure out what wilderness was. And thinking about those contributing factors and threats, we got into conflict. Why? You know, in subcommittee of Congress, uh, people were, were proposing to allow mountain bikes in wilderness as an inroad kind of. It was very much a threat. And we hadn't done any research on mountain bike because they'd never been in, in, in wilderness before. Uh, in the Sierras, there was a lot of horse hiker conflict. There was a whole bunch of stuff coming up. And the literature had been kind of dead for a few years. So uh, we certainly pursued conflict research. Mid-90s, the recreation fees. The fee demo program came in, and, and we were asked to understand fees. We took it to another level, a couple of different levels, uh, one on sustainable uh, financing and one in public purpose marketing, thinking about setting prices and, and what exactly was the federal role in generating and, and managing uh, revenue. Uh, uh, moved into trust. Adam knows all about that. Uh, probably the most dangerous thing we ever did in our social science research was trying to figure out how to measure and understand uh, trust, trust in the agency, trust in uh, even as scientists, you know, we've tried to understand uh, trust of, uh, between the management agency and the, and the science community. We work in communities sometimes where there's distrust within the, uh, within the community that we've, we've looked at some. Some of that was related to fire, obviously. Uh, we got heavy into attitudes towards managing ignited fire. Special provisions, we used to talk about uh, non-conforming uses. We got heavily into you know, things like grazing, you know, people encountering cattle in wilderness. You know, what's that cow doing there? It's not the same as encountering a person. Does that have something to do with solitude or is it something else? What aspect of the experience? Uh, commercial recreation activities. They're specifically forbidden in the Wilderness Act. Then they're allowed through a special provision to the extent necessary. Well, what is that exactly? And so we've published papers, if that's a topic that interests you. Uh, it's not focusing on wilderness recreation or wilderness values so much. It's trying to figure out what Congress was trying to do when they wrote these special provisions and how do we manage them. Ecosystem services is a topic that people asked us for a long time to get into, and it wasn't until we really got into it and saw what some of the economists were doing and attaching values to a lot of things that kind of scared us. And particularly some of our research suggested concepts like intrinsic values of nature and spiritual values of wilderness and nature that kind of protected through wilderness legislation were, were real incompatible with, with dollar values and monetary systems. And so we started working with, with people like uh, Chris Armitas and Tyron Ben here on campus and a whole bunch of people internationally and in Mexico and Canada to come up with w what we think is better approaches to ecosystem services that allows you to look at trade-offs across cultures, across, across values, and the, the monetary uh, aspect of it is, is really secondary or tertiary. Uh, but we think it's really important. So we look, worked a lot with water values flowing from wilderness and protected areas. Uh, right now, you know, it's been a couple of weeks revising a paper on uh, public attitude towards intervention for climate change and restoration. So intervention to adapt to you know, vulnerability issues in climate change in the future. How do you feel about that in wilderness and restoration, correcting some of the things we've done wrong in the past, particularly with fire and wildlife and vegetation and things. Um, 
and I say cultural landscapes. It's uh, probably the thing that uh, one of the things I enjoy most about my job is that we've had an opportunity, and I'll, you'll understand that better as we move along with cultural landscape. So there's my list, Mom. Uh, I wish I could have explained it to you, and you wouldn't have ever understood it. But that's, that's pretty much who I am. So now let's go to, to some more stories. So the second story that I have, besides the first one, is kind of about what wilderness social scientists do. I hope you have a good feeling for that. Any of those topics interest you, I'm the guy to come talk to. I'm not the only wilderness social scientist. We're the only institution completely focused on wilderness research. But we work at a lot of academics around the country, that, and some people might do some other pieces of wilderness science. But that's been our program for the last 27 years, and really now you know the social science that Forest Service funded and the Interagency Institute for about 37 years. You, you got that story. Story number two I wanted to talk about, and I don't know why I started, other than I, I put something in the uh, title of this, um, of this presentation about it's bigger than wilderness. And I wanted to explain that right off the bat. We were, we were called to work up at Denali National Park and Preserve, and they were in a typical recreation planning mode, and they were selecting indicators and standards, and we were working with them, had a lot of meetings, and we did some research, and they had some some uses of that of Denali that they couldn't quite figure out what to do with. They drew circles around them and left them behind and went on with planning. And what those places were were high use places. Imagine that you fly in to, to Denali, land on a glacier, land on ice fields, snow fields, getting ready to go skiing or or, or climb up Mount McKinley. And uh, there's a whole bunch of people there. You know, a lot of people. They can be camped there for several days. They've got you know, human waste issues. They've got noise issues. Uh, think about this place as a lot of people congregating in a very remote place. What are the standards? How are they going to manage that? So we took on some research at that area, took on several projects. We did a typical survey of recreation visitors we, of, of people engaging in uh, in recreation, but we also did a lot of work with these airplanes, with the air taxis, and with the, the people who are flying in and trying to understand not only that they're flying in and then they're climbing Mount McKinley maybe or, or one of the other major mountains in the area uh, or spend some time back there in the winter. The only way they could get there was to fly in. Uh, of these large numbers of people back there, but also the people are coming and doing glacier landings, not getting out hardly other than throw a snowball or build a little snowman to send, send a picture to your friends back in Georgia, you know, that you were there and, and had this, made this little snowman on a glacier. And, uh, and then also the people who were doing uh, kind of flight seeing that didn't land at all. And what they're really interested in, again, is kind of a commercial or transportation special provision. Uh, that they just left, they weren't managing these people very much and thinking about, about those as being wilderness dependent experiences. And under Anilka, both the wilderness and non wilderness places up there are managed as for wilderness recreation experiences. And they didn't have a handle on that very much. So we're doing some projects. And one of the things we were doing, we were interviewing, uh, we were interviewing a lot of these people, spend a lot of time with them. You'll understand a little bit later why we're doing these interviews and spending time with them. But really trying to understand kind of the relationship to wilderness. And over the years, if I had to say one thing that's come out of that long list of, of research topics is that I would say that we focus mostly on relationships between humans and nature, or humans and, and protected nature that we call wilderness in our country. I think if you go back to 1988, we were studying recreation, and we're, we're trying to study crowding. And along the lines, we've changed and learned more over the years, and we're very focused on relationship. And this relationship we're trying to figure out, it was so interesting the day that, that you Katie know, Notech, I was hoping she's here tonight, she was interviewing somebody, and, and she asked a question, is it wilderness or is it not wilderness? And it happened to be a solo hiker that was going up Mount McKinley. And, and we'd ask that question of most people, 
And if they said yes, we could say, well, why is it wilderness? <laughs> if, if they say no, then why is it not wilderness? You know, is, it, is it a national park? Is it still wilderness? Is it something about you know, what, what makes you define it that way? Numbers of people, amount of planes, noise, what is it? So it's a great way to get people to talk. And this guy kind of floored Katie by going, oh, no. It's bigger than wilderness. And, you know, the recreation opportunity spectrum, a planning uh, uh, framework the Forest Service, BLM uses a lot, you know, talks about from developed to undeveloped, and wilderness is over here. You know, campgrounds, picnic areas over here, and there's things in between, front country. And that's usually the spectrum that we talk about, and I would have probably before that statement transformed me, with realization, uh, I would have been talking about wilderness as the end of that spectrum. And it was so interesting when this guy said that, we, we spent some time talking about that. It's bigger than wilderness. And I'm guilty. I use this in World Wilderness Congress proceedings. I've used it in a couple of articles. Not reporting the research, but trying to get people to go, what's he talking about? What's he talking about? Bigger than wilderness. And we talked about it in two ways. One, I've worked a lot in South Africa with mega reserves. And I really like that concept of mega reserves with wilderness at the core. So to me, it hit me, ah, oh, mega reserves, sometimes World Heritage Sites, are bigger than wilderness. We often put wilderness at the core. There's some basic benefits and values, attributes, that are flowing out here from that wilderness that are social and biophysical. And that's one way to think of it. But what this person was talking about is he explained it. In wilderness, we often get into the discussion of, of wildness and naturalness. And we think of um, wilderness, again, as kind of in land management at the end of the spectrum for protecting wildness. And I've always been, uh, speaking of motorcycles, uh, I've always been into wildness. I, I really like the concept of wildness. And several friends and I agreed a long time ago that wilderness is one way, okay, there are many others, that kind of protects or provides that wildness for us. What's unique about it is it's trying to provide it for society into the future. And we really like that. And so when this person says it's bigger than, than wilderness, it hit a lot of us for that kind of psychological reason to think of not just Denali as a core area and everything being connected out here biophysically and, and psychologically, but in the wildness realm, this person said, oh, it's way beyond wilderness. It's bigger than a wilderness. And certainly, you know, scale is complex there, what he's talking about. I want to talk about scale some more in, in the third story. And it's also at Denali. And a lot of things came up uh, during those projects. And, and we were interviewing, as I said, air taxi operators. It was interesting that the park service was not welcome in the offices of the air taxi operator. There was a lot of conflict. But we were, as scientists, and we enjoyed talking to them and trying to get their, trying to get their story. Uh, they were eager to tell us. And we were trying to ask them, you know, is this wilderness? Is it not wilderness? And, and what do you think people get out of flying if they don't land or if they do land on a glacier? You know, what's happening in these airplanes that are flying around out there? They're over wilderness. Is it wilderness dependent or is it not wilderness dependent? Are there things we should be doing to protect some kind of experience that we haven't defined very well yet? But can we define it, first of all, then understand how to protect it? And this one air taxi operator, as if we would understand, said, oh, it's like flying inside, he said. And we're still struggling with that, trying to figure out what he was talking about. If, if any of you have, have been a backcountry pilot, particularly at Denali, and you're trying to picture, you know, we're trying to picture these airplanes and how they fit in. And last is unique. You know, we've had people at Gates the Arctic and Denali say, when they see an airplane, they, they think, oh, those are people like me. They're accessing the same place. You get that? You, if you haven't been there, you might be thinking, like if you're in your backyard or you're hiding in, in the Bob Marshall and you see an airplane, you might go, you know, damn, airplane, that's the third one I've seen today. Or, you know, what's he doing down here low or something? But actually, there's a really different relationship that people can see that airplane and think, oh, it's just people like me. And you almost 
you know, accept them and bond with them. And you don't see a lot of, particularly in very remote places, that's the only way you get there. And there's even some climbers would say that when they would see airplane, they knew there was a window of weather probably for a few hours or however long it took those planes to come in and go back out that they would probably be able to move up the mountain or they'd be able to summit. So the airplanes were kind of sending messages that were really, really interesting. These pilots and the people were talking about scale and they would say it's kind of a wilderness, empty landscape if you're flying around. And it's like flying inside, you know. I mean, you know, I'm starting to get dizzy thinking about it, you know, that you're trying, to, you're trying to focus on scale, but imagine if you were flying inside, you know, you couldn't quite catch the scale of things and you'd turn too late or too early or, or something. But seeing people gave it scale. And they identified those people and he a little, looked like a toy airplane. I thought about getting up on the couch and putting little toy airplanes and people down there and trying to see what that was like, you know, if I was flying around in the room. You know, does that give me any impression of, of what that's like? But saying that, that, that the interaction with the wilderness landscape from those airplanes, until you grasp the scale, you, you didn't walk away with the story. And actually seeing people and those congregation places down there was actually helping them realize the scale. And that's when people would get their kind of aha moment in flying around and flying around Denali. So it's flying like, it's like flying inside still stumps us just a little bit. And he said it as if we don't know instantly what he's talking about. And we're still trying to understand that scale thing and how people interact with that wilderness landscape and what is happening down. If you removed all the people or spread them out, realize that that, that scale thing you know, could be dissipated some. Another thing that people said, and we really took this quote, and I use this a lot too, not in any research. I'm not reporting research here as much as kind of anecdotal. Um, we would say, is it wilderness? Yeah. Are you engaging in wilderness experiences? No because you're not carrying a pack, you're not, you know, necessarily, unless you're climbing, if you're actually an airplane or glacier landing, there's a lot of people that felt like it was wilderness, and they wanted to see that wilderness, but they wanted to keep it at arm's length. And I kind of grouped the tour. Has anybody ridden that bus through Denali? You gone through there? You know, you're looking, at, you're looking at wilderness on both sides. I mean, you're going, you know, right through, right through wilderness. And... A good friend of mine, Bob Manning from University of Vermont, was doing research up there, and he, he coined a term, something like near wilderness. But we're trying to articulate what the experience is and then try to figure out how to manage it. And that's one that we've used a lot. You'll see that on some publications on our website, you know, on the outside looking in, or wilderness at arm's length. And, you know, sometimes when we work with special provisions or or these aircraft landings or flight seers, there's a certain part of our wilderness science community that go, why are we studying them? Their, their experiences aren't described in wilderness. Although in Alaska, they're probably in Anilka, the wilderness recreation experiences. But, but we're really trying to figure out decisions about wilderness management. Are there attachments or meanings attached to that landscape that aren't well-defined in the Wilderness Act that we may be impacting? You'll see later we do that a lot with, with indigenous people, trying to understand the relationship that native people have with wilderness in Alaska and how it might even be different or opposed to the relationship defined for people in wilderness in the Wilderness Act. So we make decisions, how's it going to affect some of these other people. And that realization, that acceptance, even... Sometimes, uh, like with jet boaters, we sent Mike Patterson, our uh, associate dean here, down to study jet boaters. He came down with a jet boat hat. It's like, uh oh, you know, <laughs> he's uh, gone over the dark side. We're trying to figure these people out. And what happens is you get kind of caught up in them. They're real people with real relationships with wilderness, just different than your relationship or the one described in the Wilderness Act. As a matter of fact, in Alaska, you know, I'm going to be done with Alaska here. I'm going to move on. But uh, I kept getting caught up when I started trying to think of some stories or these realizations. And one of them, it wasn't even research, 
but I was in Alaska, and you know, a lot of people have tried to convince me over time that you know, wilderness is the same thing to all people at all places. And actually, one of my mentors on the top line of the previous of that first slide has really been an advocate that you know, let's don't differentiate eastern wilderness and western wilderness. Let's don't think of Alaska wilderness different. You know, it, it's wilderness, it's national preservation system. People should go there, receive similar experiences, benefits somehow. It's always kind of fuzzy to me. But I was actually teaching a class up in Alaska, University of Alaska Anchorage. And I was with a group of students. Okay, so we're, we're up there, we're not down here, okay? And we're trying to figure out you know, is wilderness different in Alaska than it was in Lower 48? And one of the students made the comment, in Lower 48, if you can drive there, it's not wilderness. You have to walk. Okay? We kind of feel that. You don't drive to wilderness. It always feels weird. We even studied the remoteness one time for a few years back in the early 90s trying to understand. You know, remoteness was a requirement was a, a proposed standard for wilderness in the original discussions of the Wilderness Act during those many years they debated, and it got removed. And some of my friends go, well, thank goodness it did, you know. I mean, they actually, through congressional debate, removed the idea of remoteness. It doesn't appear in the legislation. It's not in our policy. And people said, you know, the ring around L.A. would not be wilderness today if, if there was a requirement for remoteness. There's a lot of other benefits associated with those places. But we've studied that, trying to understand perceptions of remoteness. So if you can drive there, it doesn't always feel like, like, like wilderness. You have to walk. But in Alaska, if you can walk there, it's not wilderness. You have to fly. Oh, boy, think about that, you know. When that student said that, it's like, oh, thank you. You know, I got a gym right there, and, I, and here I am these several years later telling you. But it affected the way I started thinking about wilderness in Alaska very much. About my first time I met Adam Liljeblad at Walker Lake in Gates of the Arctic, I was getting off a float plane, and he was getting on it. Next, next year he worked for us in Fairbanks, and the year after that he's down here for graduate school. Uh, but that float plane experience and getting in there and, and, and meeting someone, probably a part of our long-term relationship. Another student at the University of Alaska Anchorage said, in Lower 48, the wilderness is surrounded by development. You know, the Frank Church, River No Return Wilderness, our largest, right? Our largest wilderness in Lower 48, 2.4 or 5 million acres. Largest contiguous wilderness surrounded by other wilderness. You can drive around it. I have many times, <laughs> more than I, I want to admit. You know, when we were doing research, and I had to be here one day and a meeting over there the next day, and then I was putting counters and, and checking registration boxes, and I had to be somewhere to get a student somewhere. You can drive completely around it. And I thought that was real interesting. Someone in Alaska said, well, your wilderness is surrounded by development. In Alaska, development is surrounded by wilderness. And that is surrounded by wilderness. And, and it's when, it, it was actually a, a, a young woman, when she said, and that's surrounded by wilderness. I felt that distance. I felt that scale. And it just changed how I look. I've, I've, how many people have been to Anaktuvik Pass? It's the last nomadic community we've had in the United States. They settled right there along the boundary of the gates of the Arctic National Park so they could get their mail in like 1958 or 59. They'd never find them to give them their mail. And uh, they settle right there. When you sleep there at night, you can feel it right here. You lay down, you feel not just the wilderness that you can see, but you can feel the wilderness for a couple hundred, two or three hundred miles beyond that. Story six. In 1978, I was uh, a graduate student at Virginia Tech, and we were studying some wildernesses in North Carolina. Linville Gorge, Shining Rock, came in in 1964. This is Joyce Kilmer Slick Rock. It had come in the mid 70s with the eastern uh, kind of wil the, the so called Eastern Wilderness Act. And remember, this is 1978. Wilderness Research Unit started here in 67. It was just 12 years after that. And we were trying to replicate the studies and recreation back there that had been done out here in the late 60s, early 70s. And we're, we're very focused on recreation use, and that's all we knew about wilderness, really, was what the wilderness 
bed. And we spent the summer interviewing backpackers and kind of, you know, southern hippies like me that were coming out there and, and going backpacking and, and doing strange things in the wilderness. And it wasn't until that fall that I went out there and ran into a guy that I didn't put on my list, but is one of my mentors. His name was Dillard Shope. Dillard passed away a few years ago. But I met him at a trailhead on an October afternoon. And Dillard began to tell me about his relationship with the wilderness. And he was like, God, they didn't tell us anything about this school. He explained to me that, that all the land had at one time either been in private holdings or timber company holdings. And through the Weeks Act, it had come back into, into public lands as under the guise of protecting the headlands of navigable streams. And that he could talk about you know, family cemeteries, family farms, family home places inside that wilderness. And like, whoa, Bob Lucas and George Stanky and John Hindy aren't talking about those things at all. You know, the wilderness research we were reading in the 70s, the record research wasn't talking about this at all and here we were trying to replicate that and here I am set with this guy he had his trailer parked there at the, the trailhead and he was going raccoon hunting and bear and boar hunting at night and scaring all the hikers said come out and see these guys with guns and like what's going on you know they weren't expecting it but I really got to know this guy and listen to his story and about middle of the afternoon he said uh he jumped up. He goes, oh, it's Big Leonard. And this big four-wheel drive pickup come up with three guys. And Big Leonard got out with his son Daryl and his other son Daryl. And, uh, <laughs> and, and Dillard ran over and introduced me. Dillard got to know me really good. And he pulled all the right strings, just like Mike Patterson coming home with a, with a jet boat hat. If there had been a Dillard Shope hat, I would have had it on when I came home that day. Because I, he pulled all the right strings. You know, I'm a farm boy. And, and he talked to me about, well, what about that, you know, what you did with your dad or your grandpa or what they taught you? And, and like, oh, man, yeah. You know, it makes so much sense. And I, and I just, it was just brand new to me. And it was just the fall, my first, I was a master's student at Virginia Tech. And it's like, I discovered the world, you know. It goes way beyond what I've been reading as an undergraduate. And got real excited. And, and, and he told Dillard, or he told Big Leonard that, you know, we need to give Alan our names and addresses so we can participate in his survey. And there's all these problems, you know, that they've got. And they're going to work with the Forest Service to solve them. And Big Leonard grabbed his rifle off the gun rack. And he aimed it right over my shoulder at this trailhead sign and said, I'll tell you what we do. We shoot the first trail walker, come down that trail, put him in a shallow grave right there, and there won't be any problems. And it's like... Whoa! Yeah. <laughs> well, I couldn't believe it, you know. I didn't know there was that kind of conflict going on. We were living a pretty sheltered life in academia. So I spent, you know, that day sitting there right here at number three at, at Big Fat Gap talking to, to uh, Dillard Shope and, and, uh, and, and uh, Big Leonard and, and uh, his son Daryl and his other son Daryl. And, and I just... I was so excited about it that I drove all through the night to get back to Blacksburg, Virginia. And I broke all the safety rules we have in the Forest Service to get back and took a quick shower. I ran in the office. I was there waiting for my major professor. And I started telling him this stuff. He's a good farm boy from the Thumb of Michigan. And we got so excited. This wasn't anything we were reading about from the wilderness literature at that time that got us so excited. And we're trying to figure it out. And you know what we did? We didn't have Google back then, in 19, fall 78. We jumped up and ran to the library and found the book Black Like Me. We were so excited because we knew vaguely that this journalist back in the 60s wanted to write about African American people and he chose to color his own skin and write from within their society. We thought, that's what we're going to do. We're going to send Alan down to Robbinsville, North Carolina, and he can come back on, once in a while and take a class or two, and he'll move down there, and he'll get to know everybody, and he'll write all these great stories. We proposed that to several people. By the way, if people laugh at you, you're probably on the right track, okay? Because <laughs> a lot of people laughed at us. They said, that's not what wilderness research is about. The Wilderness Act says this and this. And this kind of prescribes a relationship for us. But, you know, we keep running into people that have different relationships. And we'd like to document those. If nothing else, just because if we lose those, let's make sure we, we, we know what we've lost. And uh, nobody funded us. We couldn't get any 
funding. So all my hopes rested on Dillard. And I couldn't wait for his survey to come in. For those of you who've done survey research, you know, you, you, everything's anonymous, but I had his ID number. And I was waiting. I was checking the mail every day because, by gosh, when I get Dillard Shope's survey, and I had his son-in-law's address too, I would look what he, how he answered our questions and look what he wrote. And this is entirely different than what we think of as wilderness experiences. And, and we've got to honor it somehow. It's just so important. Well, his survey came in, and his son-in-law, they were in the same envelope, same handwriting. <laughs> I opened them up. On every page across the top and the bottom, it said, no more hickers or trail wakers. Every page. Didn't answer any of the questions. God, I'm so excited about this knowledge I was getting, going to get from Dillard. Kind of bring it in the scientific world from that conversation I'd had with him. And you know, back then, we didn't even recycle. We threw it in the trash. Nothing. But let me tell you that today we can talk about hermeneutics. When Mike Patterson started talking to us about interpretation of stories that people tell us when he was a graduate student years ago and passed on to other graduate students here at the University of Montana. I can see several of you sitting around here that, that have taken classes from him, research methodology. Bill Borey talking about let's separate the off-site stuff and attitudes and perceptions from what happens on site and, and how people go through experiences as in situ, kind of collecting data, trying to understand ebbs and flows of wilderness experiences, moving more to qualitative methods from what we saw in the 60s and 70s, early 80s, mixed methods a lot. Right now we work a lot with the University of Leeds, a bunch of geographers over in England and try not only to describe relationships to landscapes, but map them with fuzzy GIS mapping methods. We talk a lot about cultural landscapes, and a lot of that's with na native people, indigenous people. I'm doing it for Dillard, too. I want to document, I want to understand those cultural landscapes. I want to be able to develop methods. I work with Chris a lot in developing methods to understand you know, native perspectives, environmentalist perspectives, recreation perspectives. Seems like there's another one. I can't think of what it is. But trying to come up with ecosystem services and look at trade-offs and acknowledge those trade-offs. There's not just one dominant value to the landscape. We work with native people around the, around the world. Story number seven, I'm not doing very good. I have to speed it up. Uh, speaking of Nunavut, I'll just say that, that uh, we worked up in Nunavut. We were doing some research in Alaska and Parks Canada asked us to replicate some of that. And it's not real important what we're doing. It was fairly typical kind of recreation research, but we're also working with communities. Uh, doctoral student here from University of Montana, Paul LaChapelle, was doing some work for us up there. And probably, well, there's Paul. Probably the thing that intrigued us the most when we think we're understanding this wilderness thing and, and some of the recreation uh, purposes of people going for was to find out that some people said they went there because it was the farthest place they could go on domestic frequent flyer miles. Like, whoa, we've never thought about that before. <laughs> Does that have anything to do with management? Uh, what do we do? You know, do, do we have a, a job to, to keep them there, to, to engage in cultural activities? Are these people prepared? I think the, uh, on one of the trips we were up on 4th of July, we actually saw not only did one of our people fall in the water and cause uh, it was very cold, it was snowy, uh, but one of the, some of the visitors, a young couple, had gone there because it was the farthest place they could go in Canada on their frequent flyer miles and they went backpacking like they would anywhere else. And the tent got destroyed by wind they in, the, in the night in a rescue shelter and were escorted out the next day. So there were a lot of implications of that that we didn't really understand or we hadn't expected very much. I must speed up a little bit, other than just to say that, that quite often we got into to finding people valuing uncertainty, valuing discovery, and that story they had to tell was one that we were eager to capture and try to understand as it unfolded or as they remembered it you know, later and pulling from that to understand 
kind of the basic elements of their experiences, the things that, that threaten them. So if we're working with Native people in, in, uh, in, uh, up in the uh, Western Arctic parklands, and they tell us that one of the things that influences their experiences in wilderness is when park managers come camp beside them, they think they're doing a good job, you know, to talk to the natives. It just destroys the experience for the native people. Trying to understand, I think, on Kobuk River, um, something like, uh, you know, we found out that motorboats were causing a huge impact on the experience that hunters were having on the Kobuk River. Who was using motorboats? National Park Service was using motorboats. They stopped doing that, <coughs> put their uh, kind of patrolling secondary to some of the wilderness value. Just real quick on the main fork of the, the salmon, we studied backpackers, we studied horse users, we studied a whole bunch of things there, and we went in to study this special provision. And Frank Church, Senator Frank Church, certainly talked about the working men and women of Idaho, but we were certainly thinking about those people as non-conforming. Again, think of where I come from, from Virginia Tech and my mentors and recreation, and, and thinking about the Wilderness Act and what it says we're supposed to get out of wilderness. And we had special provisions that were allowing motorboat use, jet boat use, to continue to occur on the main fork of the salmon. Managers just drew a circle around them. Then at some point in time, they said, you know, we need to start managing them. And so through the University of Montana and Leopold Institute, we went down to try to understand those jet boat users and did a series of studies down there. Uh, and where it took us to was, were the concepts of, you know, with floaters, with raft floaters, commercial and, and private, we could go down and do a typical recreation study through the year, but with jet boaters, we started trying to approximate the population. Not for the interviews, we only interviewed kind of, uh, you know, leaders in that community. But with, uh, we tried to do a survey of, of anyone who'd ever jet boated on the main fork of the salmon. We found a lot of dead people that, that jet boated on the main fork of the salmon. Their wives or children send back their surveys to us. But we, through a process of identifying people, we wanted to talk to anybody. And it really changed that we've done that with Steep Creek kayakers. We've done it with other places as well. And it's really a different approach to research and methodology than going out and doing a summer recreation study for the people who are there right now. How about the people that have moved on, either through developing more skills or for because of conflict issues and those things? There's a lot of other methodology. And, and maybe the most important thing here was uh, that I thought you might enjoy as part of the story. When we said we could do legislative and help them study themselves and articulate their relationship with jet boating and the main fork of the salmon so they could carry those stories and, and go in negotiation with the forest as they try to manage that area, how it influences them. They said, yeah, how do we do that? And I said, well, you give me money because I don't have the money. And if you give me money, I'll get the forest to give me some money. And they go, well, there's two problems with that and I thought you'd enjoy. One is I work for the federal government. And I'm sitting in the, the basement of a title company in Boise, Idaho, with a bunch of real working men and women of Idaho. And they said, uh, you're, one, you're from the federal government. It's really hard for us to give you money. Number two, you're from Missoula. <laughs> so well, they know we're a bunch of tree huggers up here, and they really had trouble. But they did give us money, and the forest gave us money. And they, the forest supervisor called us before a meeting and said, I finally understand these jet boaters because we brought their stories in and told them and helped managers make decisions. And the only problem was then those jet boaters started recommending us to snowmobilers in Wisconsin and, and uh, jet skiers in Florida. And we had to keep saying, no, 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 no. no. We were just doing that because it had something to do with wilderness up here. OK, the last thing I was going to do is talk about places I wouldn't have been except that I was doing wilderness science. I, I could keep telling you stories. I only told you a few. And I uh, won't bore you with more. Come, come visit me in my office if you want to hear more. Uh, there are a lot of transformative realizations over the years that very much explain maybe more than the science itself some of the methodology and approaches and things that we, that we focus on now. You know, those are some of the stories. But also some of the places that I've gone. 
And it does relate back to those. One of them that really hits me was I was a Fulbright scholar in Finland. And I found myself, uh, we were studying their wilderness system, came in in the early 1990s. And it's all north of the Arctic Circle. And the primary value was protecting traditional means of livelihood. And I found myself at a reindeer camp with a Sami man. And a lot of my family, or a lot of my friends I was working with, said, we're not welcome. We don't go to those reindeer camps. We're from the south. Hey, so am I. They meant southern Finland. And uh, we're not Sami. And they proceeded to explain to me that I was exotic. Yeah, I kind of like that. And I was non-threatening. And doors open. I was studying wilderness, something that, you know, the Sami people didn't quite know, but they kind of liked it. It was done for them. And so doors open. But I would say doors open to Dillard Shope, doors open to air taxi operators at, 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 at Denali. There's a lot of doors open. And you look back at it. That research, being a scientist, not a manager, making policy decisions, but trying to, as my major professor said, I seek the truth. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to figure this out. I'm trying to figure out these experiences. You know, I'm, not, I'm trying not to take a position. I'm truly interested in, in knowledge and understanding. The other place I went in Finland was called Montaniemi. No one knows what that is, right? It's like the White House. And not because the president invited me, but I happened to meet the president's chef way up in uh, Uchioki in northern Finland. And my friend said, how did you get invited to the White House? I went in the, or the Montaniemi, but I went in through the back door. And I got to see where Bill and Hillary had had uh, dinner a few years before that. And, and my friends just, you're exotic. You're non-threatening. And I like that about being a wilderness scientist. South Africa, um, I wanted to say that, that just a quick story about, about a guy named Murphy Morobi. And uh, I spoke up at a conference over there, a congress, and I spoke up with something that lost me a lot of friends and made me a lot of friends. When I kind of challenged the concept of, of wilderness on private lands, big conservation movement in South Africa, a lot of it's private land. And it's, I struggle with the, the concept of wilderness as we know it coming through the public sector and having someone making decisions about it. And that's a, an issue all around the world. We only have one private wilderness that I know in the United States. And we, it, it hasn't really, really gone. But they asked me to come back. And I had the, the terrible task of seeking out and describing the wildest places of South Africa. And I was trying to describe them through their attributes. And it was Murphy Morobi uh, that was a uh, you know, black African high up in the government that introduced me to the concept of uncorrupted landscapes. We talk about untrammeled a lot. And that untrammeled is a word that very much reflects the cultural identity of the people who wrote the Wilderness Act. I get in trouble with this at work all the time. I'm safe. I don't think anyone from Leopold Institute here tonight. But I say it's a concept developed and supported by wealthy, white, leisured men from the eastern United States that go home after wilderness trips. And I'm sure thankful that they were successful because I like the concept of wilderness. And now my job is to try to figure out the range of values to different people. In South Africa, they would talk about corrupted landscapes. A plastic bag hanging on a plant would corrupt it. A track going through, a, if it was a track for hauling wealthy tourists, it corrupted. If it was a track to haul water to a remote community, it wasn't corrupted. Really complex. But in that post-apartheid political atmosphere describing what they're trying to protect about nature, a lot of it had to do with corruption. And actually, Murphy Morovi's job was to uh, seek out corruption. And I just, uh, in, in 2005, no, 2001, at the World Wilderness Congress there, he was on stage with this guy named Vali Musa. I don't know if anybody knows him. He was, pres he was president of the IUCN, International Union of Conservation of Nature. He was the Ministry of Environment. He actually got those plastic bags hanging on those plants 
named the national flower of South Africa. They've been working trying to, you know, he was the Minister of the Environment. He had that kind of influence, uh, obviously, to raise attention. Uh, we've, we've gone so far from our roots. Uh, but this headline reminds you that in 1987, those guys were, you know, one of them in the government, one of them against the government, in jail by 2001 when we were there. They were on the stage together promoting conservation. I don't talk anymore about the private uh, wilderness. And uh, I think my, my next to last is uh, being in, in Russia as a Fulbright scholar. Uh, I assume most of you know that, that Finland, the lady of Finland, used to have two arms. She doesn't anymore. But what the Finnish people call the continuation war the Russian people would refer to as a great patriotic war. In 1939, Russia tried to move their boundary, protect themselves more from what they saw Germany doing, took land from, from uh, Finland during that uh, uh, winter war. Well, then later, Germany supported Finland to push back against Russia and uh, came right up to this boundary to the right and reestablished their, their boundary they'd lost in 39 and stopped. And the Russian or the Germans were saying, no, no, keep going, keep going. No, no, we're stopping. And they had a front there. What's interesting about it, I went to visit a protected area, one of those uh, Zapovniki up in that area in, in Karelia today. And what I thought would be looking at nature, what we're looking at was remnants of that kind of the, the, the front line of the Finnish army supported by the Germans. And what they claim is that in most other places, it's, you won't find that evidence. The fact that it's a strictly protected nature area has those remnants. And their nature system isn't extremely for recreation or social values. But this is one that now a lot of Finnish soldier, old Finnish soldiers are coming to. They felt like they're in the wilderness. And in fact, it's strict nature reserve at this point in time, including their old uh, where they used to show movies. And if you've ever been to Finland and understand their relationship with Russia, then stand on that Russian side in a protected area and think about the relationship between war and nature protection, particularly if you're a Fulbright scholar, a program that's dedicated to world peace through an intercultural understanding. I'm really happy to be that exotic, non-threatening uh, wilderness scientist. The last thing, I'm sorry I don't have more time to go into it, but in doing research with native communities, we've tried to understand those relationships with the landscape, map those relationships. And one of the things that impressed me more than anything is right up here with the um, thinking of the wilderness in uh, the, the tribal wilderness on the Flathead Reservation, who are asking tribal people and non-people, non-tribal people, is it wilderness, is it non-wilderness? Get them to describe those characteristics for us. Uh, the tribal, non-tribal people go, yes, it's, it's an empty landscape. The tribal people tend towards saying, yes, it's wilderness and we want to protect it because it's a storied landscape. And that difference, the whole way we look at nature is, to me, you know, it was a, a realization, I guess, that uh, took some time, but looking at a cultural landscape and actually were able to, to write some papers, written several papers, had opportunity to work with, with some great graduate students here at University of Montana and with the tribal people in, in several tribes around the country, uh, really trying to articulate that, that relationship with the places we might call wilderness, and, and they don't necessarily. But maybe the primary outcome of that research is, for me, understanding the difference between knowledge and wilderness, or knowledge and wisdom, sorry. And traditional knowledge or traditional ecological knowledge, if we're talking about the environment, is knowledge about specific plants and animals in a relationship that has been accumulated over many generations. I understand that. There's a whole field of research in that area. We've done research in that area. We've published. But what you'll find most things I write in this area is about traditional wisdom. And wisdom is the application of that knowledge, protect or restore these relationships. And that became the best definition of wilderness and the work I've done over the last 37 years that I've been able to find. Much better than anything you would find in the Wilderness Act or in the wilderness recreation literature or in most textbooks. 
applying that knowledge to protect those relationships between humans and relatively intact nature. Okay? You know, if we had more time, I was going to play a game of wait, wait, don't tell me, and have you tell me, uh, start, I was going to convince you that one of those was made up, and have you guess which one. I was going to go through and review each one. Um, but it probably won't surprise you if I tell you my 13th story is that wilderness scientists don't have to make up stories. They're all true. And uh, I, I do have one last slide because of misinformation I gave out one time. I, I made a mistake, okay? Just one that I know of. Adam, do you know of any more? Yeah, Elena, Bill, any? I, just one, I think. I made one mistake. And uh, we're doing a theme issue of the International Journal of Wilderness on Denali National Park, and we had a, a uh, a native perspective, we had a management perspective, a commercial perspective, a tourist perspective. And I decided to shock the people in 2005 coming to, to the Wilderness Congress by publishing an article about subsistence use in Denali. And the dominant subsistence user are these two white women. They're twin sisters. And it's a great story. If you look, it says, this is where we live. The area wedged between the McKinley and Forker Rivers provides the two of us with our vocation, our groceries and supplies, and our emotional and spiritual well-being. It's like people are, oh, I thought it was all Navy people doing, doing subsistence in Alaska in protected areas. No, no, no. These women are living that life. At least they were 10 years ago. So we published this, this article. And we got, they sent us a slide of them. And we published it. And everything was great until her mother saw that picture. And the first thing she said is, they printed the picture backwards. And those women looked at it and they go, oh, you're right, that's me on the left, and that's you on the right. They didn't even know it themselves. <laughs> they thought, mom, how did you know that? You know, they were so happy because for 40 some years, mom could never tell them apart. They look exactly alike. And she said, the mountain's backwards. <laughs> We messed up. <laughs> so I'm confessing it right here and now that that article in 2005 in the International Journal of Wilderness, they sent us a slide. We scanned it. They're, they're twins. But my hope is that I can learn more mountains. I wish I could tell Denali from the back and recognize it as frontwards and backwards. You know, I wish I knew all those drainages and could recognize it. I wish you could blindfold me and drop me off and, and I could feel that land. You know, that's, my, that's what I strive to do. And I hope you get familiar with some wild places to where if I took a picture, next time come back, we'll play, wait, wait, no, tell me, with pictures and you can guess whether they're frontwards or backwards, okay? <laughs> some famous mountains in Montana. Thank you. Sorry I went, went so long. Questions or comments? I think of, that she promised you'd be out here in five minutes. I didn't leave you much room. There's no right or wrong of story, stories. Yeah? Uh, this is a really great presentation. It's, uh, it's interesting to me that you seem to focus so much of your work on the special provisions or sort of non conforming users um, that we don't fit into the legislative language that we consider wilderness. Uh, especially relevant that on the Missoulian today, it looks like the Forest Service is more, I suppose, explicitly incorporating backcountry pilots into their management plans um, for wilderness areas uh, throughout here, throughout Montana. I'm wondering what the institute, what your role has been in that, if any, or like what sort of research has been going on in the area um, in recent years. Okay, we've only done a couple of things with backcountry pilots, and particularly in, in Montana. You know, I mean, again, we've worked other places in trying to understand the role of airplanes and how to manage airplanes. It, and maybe the special provision that you see is because those are big manager issues. You know, recreation is a manager issue. Climate change and intervention, and restoration are, are issues that managers face. Conflict, fees, you know, I got pulled along over the years into new issues that we had to come up with new methods or rethink things, took us outside the boundary of wilderness quite a bit. But uh, one of the things we did several years ago, uh, we had an employee, Shannon Meyer, that was looking at, at legislative history. And it was really, it was really good. And it, it led us into, we, we looked at backcountry airstrips first. 
And I think what we owed the managers and the public and our responsibility as the institute was to try to figure out a process that approximates the judicial process, and I say approximates because you can never quite be 100% confidence of the judicial process, um, but let's come up with a process of looking at legislative history and we focus first of all on airstrips and we focus on the Frank Church. And we have a good, a good process that then we used on jet boats and we've used other places, but the idea of you know, with jet boats, they would say, my daddy said that Frank Church said that, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, where did he say it? Was it in debate? Was it a proposed amendment? Et cetera. You know, sometimes people will, will propose an amendment just so it'll get defeated. And once that gets defeated, you can never say that again. You know, you've, you've taken care of it. So there's a lot of little things about airstrips. Um, and we did that kind of research. Uh, that look very much at, at uh, Frank Church, and there, we have an article in International Journal of Wilderness and a report or two about the process, but we demonstrate it through that. So if you're ever interested in that topic, go try to understand why we have airstrips in the Bob Marshall and, and um, Frank Church and just one, one in Oregon, I think. We don't have it a lot down here. We have it a lot in Alaska as part of ANILCA, and we're on dangerous ground, but sometimes we call ANILCA itself a special provision of the Wilderness Act. But ANILCA has a whole string of special provisions itself, really complicated. So it's a really important topic to understand. Managers need that. So we got pulled in that. The only other thing we've ever done with, with, with backcountry pilots is we have, uh, through that LAC process, they were very much a part of at the Bob Marshall trying to engage and understand as a, commun as a community what were they after, particularly with the touch and go kind of stuff, you know, and, and flying out to go fly fishing for an hour. You know, there, people struggled with that. And so institutionally, you know, we don't set policy, but we tried to understand that and then let the community discuss it, and sometimes they would force them down the road that would start restricting those at least Let's monitor them and understand them and set some standards. So those are a couple of things. And your comment about so much special provisions, you know, I would say that, that we did the recreation research, we established methods, we provided, and I know in my own uh, position description that used my evaluation, I claim that our stuff in Nunavut, we kind of, we're done with that. We're not going there anymore. We, we've done it. Let other people do that. We have to move on to some of these other areas that, that we just haven't reached. It's, it's still a, a blooming field, blossoming field. Comment? Anyone? Anything else? Okay, great. Thanks for being here. <laughs>